Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Hitchens. The 1967 war, and I'm going to say that very clearly, the 1967 war between India and China is a moment that a lot of us don't know about. We talk about the losses that India has taken up during the 62 war, but we forget the victories that we've had over China. Recent events in Galwan and of course Yangtze tells us another story of our dominance over China. And that's something that we need to understand. To do that, I have with me someone really special, Mr. Prabhul Das Gupta, who's actually written a book on this particular thing. 1967, Watershed, The Forgotten Victory of India Over China. This book, ladies and gentlemen watching, is an interesting example of the mispackaged history of this country. Sir, thank you so much, firstly, for writing this book and joining me to talk about it because... Uh, you know, the whole Yangtze incident brings about a certain factor between the two countries that uh, this relationship is neither settled or nor, nor is in the path of being settled. So I'm looking forward to hearing your views as well as uh, the story of 1967. Thank you very much, Adi, and thanks for uh, inviting me to the show. It's a pleasure to be uh, here talking to you and discussing the book and its impact. Uh, and as you said, uh, it's a book it's a story that needed to be told uh, whose time had come long ago. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's never, uh, never, never, never long. And I think we should, we should, uh, you know, bring this story into collective uh, consciousness of people. Absolutely. So it's never too late to tell the truth. Uh, let me just begin with the name, sir. It's an interesting name. You've said the watershed, you know, and uh, in military terms, which you also belong from, uh, a watershed is a very interesting kind of uh, connotation of the borders between the two countries or the line of control between the two countries. Uh, it's also another meaning with regards to the change or the understanding of the history between the two countries. So it's relevant in both the angles. Is that why you use the name, the watershed, sir? Yes, uh, that's right. You know, this is a question that... Uh, Interesting, let, let me take a step back. You know, when we were looking at uh, giving the book a title, when I started writing the book, I gave, gave the name uh, of the book as Watershed 1967. It stayed right through. Uh, the name has stayed. The name didn't change. Uh, normally, what tends to happen is that, you know, as you, after you end, after you have uh, submitted the book to the publishers and you discuss and the name undergoes a bit of a change. In this case, uh, it didn't undergo any change. It remained as is, as was uh, at the start. And uh, I, I, I remember an, uh, an interesting incident when I went to meet uh, General Randeer Singh, who was the uh, ADC to General Sagat. He asked me, because I was, I was researching the book and I asked him, I said, you know, you know I need to understand from you uh, more about General Sagat. So he asked me straight away, you know, what is the title of your book? And I said, Watershed 1967. And he smiled and he said, you know, that's that's a very apt title. I stuck to it. Uh, so, so you know, uh, it has stayed uh, like that and it, it couldn't have had any other uh, title. Given the fact that it's a military watershed, there are three three reasons uh, three reasons why it is called watershed. One is a military watershed. The second one, uh, it's it's a geographical watershed as well. It's a border uh, between India and China. At that at some point of time, it was between India and Tibet, uh, and uh, it has been a geographical watershed. It is also a political watershed because 1967 is the last time India and China uh, went to battle. Mm. After that, for 53 years, there has been a like you said, tenacious peace tentative peace. It's never settled, but China did not ever mount an attack on India. We can talk about Galwan. Galwan was a limited, was a skirmish. But before that, uh, except for a patrol that was ambushed in 1975 and four Javans were killed, apart from that, after 1967, there hasn't been any attack mounted by China, though there have been threats, but they have there haven't been any attacks. And the last time India and China went to battle, it was India that prevailed over China, which ensured over half a century 
of peace, of tentative peace, you might say. It's also a watershed in another respect that after 1962, India fought the war of 1965, which the book starts with. So 1965 was a different war India fought uh, as compared to 1962, um, wherein India gave a good account of uh, herself in the war and you know, we, we prevailed over Pakistan in 1965. Mm -hmm. 1967 uh, was, again, a set of consecutive victories at Nathula and Chola. So, uh, you know, thereafter, India, it started a series of victories and, uh, and, and, glo and glorious history in India's uh, uh, military history, glorious chapter in military, military history of India. Whereas for China... 1967 started a series of defeats. 67, they were defeated in Nathula, then at Chola, and then in 1969, they lost uh, a battle on the banks of the river Usuri to the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. And then 1978-79, we know what happened in Vietnam. And after that, China has never fought a war. So if you look at 1967, it's a political watershed, it's a military watershed, it's a historical watershed as well, and a geographical watershed. It's interesting that you actually connote the three defeats of uh, China and, you know, these are armed defeats, of course, strategic defeats have been furthermore uh, brought about during some Bronchu as well. Uh, these were maneuvers that took place, of course. Yeah. But so the factor that I want to bring about is why do you call this particular thing a war? I do. Um, there's no, no, there's no question about it because I have my reasons. I'd like to hear yours. Why do you call it a war? And uh, how was it different than 1962 itself? Sure. So, uh, no, that's a very pertinent question, given that uh, it has always been understood or misunderstood as uh, a couple of skirmishes. Even today, when I go to a lit fest and I speak with historians, uh, they, they try and remind me that the, these were skirmishes. And I have had the opportunity, I, I kind of uh, like the the opportunity given to me to to correct them or or to set the uh, you know set right the the context and the perspective on the two mm. battles uh, the reason so 60 you know what happened in 1967 uh, if you look at the statistics if you look at the data uh, you know there were close to uh, 400 chinese deaths and over 5 340 is the official figure and then you have that's nathula and then you have Chola. Uh, and then you also have, uh, you know, 550 odd casualties on the Chinese side um, and uh, 100 or 88 killed on India on the Indian side and, and uh, a couple of hundred casualties. So when you look at the number of casualties on both sides, when you look at the fact that, you know, artillery was used on uh, on the Chinese side and then retaliated uh, by the retaliation was was, was undertaken by India, which actually caused China's defeat in Nathula. And there was a threat of using the Air Force as well. Uh, I would think, and the impact, the impact that Nathula and Chola had had on the events that followed thereafter. Uh, you know, there are those many reasons, I mean, and, and more. Why 1967... Um, the, the battles at Nathula and Chola must be given their place and must be cost, uh, called battles in the right in right earnest. Uh, given that, you know, in 1962, China had wrested the psychological advantage because of the, uh, the, the aggression, the setbacks India had suffered, the reverses India had suffered, and uh, the uh, generally inept leadership provided by the, the political uh, leadership and the military leadership, which led to India had fought very well in the limited uh, areas where the soldiers and the men, the officers had been given the autonomy to actually take on the Chinese. It is in the larger strategic sense that India failed. But if you look at the tactical leadership and the battle uh, hardiness of Indian soldiers, if you look at uh, uh, Major Shaitan Singh and you know look at some of the other battles, the Indian uh, officers and soldiers gave a great account of themselves in the local battles. Now, you take that to Nathula and Chola. In the local battles at Nathula and Chola, again, uh, given the autonomy provided to the uh, Div commander, General Sagat Singh, and his men, he, uh, he made sure 
that he made the short work of the Chinese in two consecutive battles. The impact of that was felt in the years that followed. And, you know, so many things happened. Sikkim was not a part of India. It is, it is 1967 that ignited the question of Sikkim becoming a part of India. So the geography of India changed. 1971, there are, there is a, you know, there is a classical theory that is followed that, you know, 1971, the Chinese did not interfere because of the treaty that was signed with the Soviets in which uh, clause six, I believe, was one of the clauses that said that, you know, in, in the event of India or the Soviet Union being attacked by a third power, the uh, one of the two signatories will uh, will come to the aid of the um, of the of the of the other party that was being attacked. Now, naturally, mm. India benefited there, and the Soviet Union had amassed uh, forces on the Sino-Soviet border, which prevented the Chinese forces from being brought over to the Eastern Front and interfere in the India-Pakistan war. These are the classic classical theories, and they are they are absolutely correct. But what is missed out? What is underrated? What is unremembered is the fact that in 1967, after the losses that China had incurred against India in uh, Nathula and Chola, uh, they had undergone a psychological dent, and that prevented yeah. China from even mounting. Uh, 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 you know, a regular posturing that they would otherwise do. You know, Chinese are known for their posturing, but they did not posture in 1971, number one. Number two, there is also, when you look at the history of Nathula and Chola in 1967, <coughs> and the, 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 the genesis of all of this goes back to 1965, when uh, India and Pakistan were waging a war on the Western Front. Uh, there was something happening on the Eastern Front. In Sikkim, China was mounting pressure on India and pushing India at two outposts, which was Nathula and Jelepla. Uh, the story starts from there. And there is, there is one decision that General Sagat, who was a newly appointed division commander at that time uh, in, in Gangtok, had taken, which actually uh, changed the course of history. When the Chinese pushed India, and, you know, the Chinese wanted India to pull back from Nathula and Jelepla. Uh, there was a meeting that was held at the core headquarters in Siliguri before the India-Pakistan war, in which it was decided if there is Chinese pressure on India, India will pull back from the two border outposts of Nathula <coughs> and Jelepla. At Jelepla, the DIF commander decided to pull back as the Chinese pressure increased during the 1965 war. As the war was going on the Western Front, this was happening on the Eastern Front. So the so the DIV commander decided to pull back <coughs> the Indian Army troops from Jelepla. General Sagat decided to stay on at Nathula, and he battled two kinds of people. He battled the Chinese. I mean, he pushed back the Chinese. The Chinese were quite um, quite flabbergasted that you know <coughs> India had pulled back from Jelepla, but decided not to pull back from Nathula, which was which was something new for them. They had mounted so much pressure in 1962 and the years thereafter that they had expected India to pull back. But here was a general who had stood his ground, who decided not to pull back. So he was pushing the Chinese. The other set of people who he actually took on were his own superiors. And I must say this. I have said this at many places that there was, there was pressure. There was intense pressure on him from his superior officers who wanted him to pull back. But General Sagat stood his ground and he decided that this is what he would do. I, I have often talked about it in several seminars. And I was uh, in, uh, you know, when I went to 27 Dev, I was speaking at Kalimpong. And I spoke about this there that, you know, um, General Sagat decided because and I, it's a classic case of leadership dilemma or a decision dilemma where you are faced with a decision making dilemma, which involves taking a call <coughs> based on your understanding of the situation and taking a call based on protocol. And this mm -hmm. was one instance, I'll come to Sondorong Chu, in, you know, as we speak about it, but this was one instance <coughs> where General Sagat, uh, in a departure from what had happened in 1962 and where, you know, the, the writ was run from some place and, and, you know, the local commanders were not given enough autonomy. General Sagat broke away from that kind of, uh, 
you know, practice which was existing earlier in the Indian Army, in 1962, which had taken root, he had broken away from there and he decided to stay put, much to the chagrin of his senior commanders, because he believed that if he were to not pull back, the Chinese would come and sit on Natula and uh, would dictate terms because then, uh, you know, the Indian Army would be forced to pull back into lower heights. And even if the Chinese, Chinese were not uh, planning to attack Sikkim, they would have dictated terms forever in history. And uh, that would have changed the course of the war in 1971 if India was to be, again, sitting at lower heights in Sikkim with uh, the, the Chinese sitting on the watershed. That's something that General Sagat figured uh, pretty early, given that he was the man on ground, he was a leader on ground, the commander on ground. But the more important part is the factor here is that at that point of time, he had gone against the larger, a larger set of opinion because he believed that this uh, was uh, what, what he was doing was right. And uh, over, a period of, over a period of time, history has proven him to be right. It indeed has. Uh, there's no question about it because at the end of it, uh, you know, uh, tactical knowledge of a situation is always better than a far-flung view of what is actually happening. And that's that's a clear example of it. We've had many generals who stood their ground and kind of, uh, you know, changed the course of our history, if I may. Sir, but coming back to this particular skirmish, uh, the skirmish which began, and I'm going to talk about that first, which converted into a war. So they were they were three, four diff different different things that happened, which opened out armed combat. Uh, it was not just, you know, two forces got together that, 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 that started off. There yeah. were these sticking incidents that happened, which could be termed as a skirmish before the war. What were those incidents and what were the significant of things like that actually happening? Uh, as you said, starting from 65. So yeah. how did this build up to 67? Yeah. So Adi, uh, just a quick, uh, um, I would say my, my uh, the way I would describe it is, uh, it, it wasn't a war. It was not neither a war nor a skirmish. There were two battles. There were two battles which were on the watershed because a war, a war would involve a larger scale. I mean, that, that's not something that I would, uh, I wouldn't call this a war. I would call these two battles as very significant battles. So they're, they're certainly not skirmishes, but battles nevertheless. Uh, so to your question, uh, the, the origins of 1967, uh, you know, you have to go back to 1965 to see the origins of 1967. Of and, and uh, you know, I would also leave the reader to read more about it in the book, but I'll just talk about why 1965. Because, you know, uh, yes. yes. So uh, when I started researching on the book, like many people, you know, I believed, uh, and I, and I, when I was growing up, my dad would tell me the tales of Napula and Chola, but, you know, so when I grew up, this, the story took root, uh, you know, while, while discussing with a friend, which I can come to when we talk about how the book got made. Got, got you know got I got started on the book but uh, uh, the story actually starts in 1965 at a point in time which I discovered when I was researching the book that I knew uh, very little of what actually happened uh, in the years preceding 1967 so in 1965 yeah. uh, as India and Pakistan were you know uh, as, as Pakistan was threatening to uh, to, to go to war, uh, against India, it was also acting in concert with China to mount an offensive uh, on two fronts. One is <clears throat> what we know, <clears throat> the Op Gibraltar and the Op Grand Slam that followed, the, 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 um, the discrete operation followed by the classical military maneuver on the, on the Western Front. And <clears throat> there was also a Chinese uh, plan on the Eastern Front uh, across Sikkim. Because Sikkim was not a part of India, it was a protectorate state. So the Chinese believed that it could, uh, you know, and that was that was why the pressure on Atula and Chola happened. Uh, the reason was that uh, there was a plan, and this plan is something that I have uh, documented in the book, uh, and uh, it involves the CIA as well. There was a CIA spy, there was an espionage incident, the book starts with that, and uh, wherein uh, CIA was very active in Delhi. And they were tracking a Kashmiri politician who, who knew what was going to happen. But because that Kashmiri politician was, 
was told by the Chinese premier at an African at a, at a summit in Africa that you know we are acting together with Pakistan. We need your support. Uh, Shawin Lai had told him, and then uh, a few Pakistani agents had met him at, in Jeddah and told him that you know we would need your support. This Pakistani, uh, this this Kashmiri politician, they had told him, and the Kashmiri politician had had uh, had uh, divulged this to the CIA agent, who then calls up uh, Langley and tells them that look, I have found something which is gold, and these guys at Langley say that well. Uh, we are pretty much aware of it because we were playing a war game in which China and Pakistan uh, were involved, and they were uh, they would, you know, Pakistan would go to war against India in September 1965, and this is a war game played in February 1965, uh, and uh, you know it was a book that was written in the U.S. and published in March 1965, and the book went off shelves in August 1965. And in September 1965, the war takes place. So um, I couldn't find the book for a long time, and uh, finally somebody was, you know, from somewhere I, I got a copy of the book. Uh, it's a very, it's a thin book in which the entire crisis game is documented, and and they talk about India and Pakistan going to war six months before they did, and um, and the Chinese role in it, which which is corroborated by what the CIA uh, spy, uh, who uh, Duane Claridge. Uh, found out, and he wrote in his book. He was later involved in the Iran Contra uh, scam, and uh -huh. so I picked up his book and I found it there. So there, you know, different dots and connects, which, uh -huh. uh, which tell you what happened. One one form is to write a linear history and and document the events, but the other thing is to find out if there was something behind this that was going on, which has not been told, and this certainly hadn't been told earlier. So uh, so it started. So this was the plan was that you know Pakistani forces uh, by virtue of um, op Gibraltar inciting the locals in Kashmir followed by a classical military maneuver of grand slam would go into the valley and would take Srinagar uh, which will be followed in, or which will be in unison with the Chinese forces moving into Gangtok or going into Sikkim and getting India to the Negotiations table for a barter in which the Chinese would pull back from Sikkim in exchange for India giving away Kashmir to Pakistan, and the plan was to have a short, quick war in which they would together bring India to its knees. The idea was also firmed up because of the situation, given that India had a new leadership at that point of time. And, uh, and and a completely new leadership and uh, you know untested leader Lal Bahadur Shastri. We know a lot about you know all of that history of Tashkent, etc. So <clears throat> so time was right, and India was also uh, China was a bogey for India, and as proved by General Sagat Singh's stand in 1965 in Nathula. And if you connect these dots, the way the military leadership, the the political leadership was was very much wary of China, tells you a lot about how the kind of pressure. That India was under, so this was a good time to to mount uh, the the whole, uh, you know, uh, to, to to look at 1965 in, in that sense. You know, so it starts the story starts in 1965. Then, of course, there was a pushback, and uh, the Chinese plans never materialized because the Pakistani plans didn't materialize, and mm -hmm. India moved into Lahore and uh, close to Lahore, and all of those things happened. So, because but the Chinese threats continued to mount. And there was there is this interesting incident in 1965 on the 26th of August, uh, one fine morning, the Chinese accused India of stealing 800 uh, sheep and 59 yaks, wow. and threatened to go to war. So uh, of course it was all drama, drama, and uh, you know, again a lot of posturing and dramatics involved on the Chinese side, and the Indians responded as well. So there was a lot of Uh, there were there were diplomatic tussles. There were back and forth uh, messages and angry missives exchanged between the two sides. One politician, a 42 year old politician, decided to take matter into his own hands. He decided to take 800 sheep or a few hundred sheep, not be 800, but a few hundred sheep, cross the streets of Delhi to the Chinese embassy, holding placards. That said, eat us, but don't go to war. 
that politician would become India's prime minister later, Mr. Atul Bihari Vajpayee. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> so this is, these are, these are, there are these little nuggets, you know, which yeah. uh, also populate the book. So uh, it's a, it's a non-fiction narrative. So it moves like a story and it talks about some of these things, which uh, again, uh, are also indicative. If you look at what happened later, Vajpayee's visit in 2003 and, you know, his, 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 uh, that a day with the Chinese, uh, you know, it gives you an insight into the man at that point of time and what was happening between the two countries as well and how he sought to look at the issue in a very different way than what uh, the traditional manner of uh, exchanges were at that point in time, 1965. Um, so that happened and, you know, in the period between 64, 60, between 62 and 67, Chinese, the Chinese became very powerful. They had tested the nuclear missile yeah. three times in four years and they had uh, they had also lit up many fires in india they had started them they had begun the northeastern the insurgency in the northeast they had supplied arms in nagaland and nefa and they had also started or they had they had uh, heavily invested in the national movement the, the, and that, that also forms a part of the book there is a period of there is a period between 64, 65 to 67, when a lot of these things were happening. And if you look at where they were happening, they were happening in North Bengal, where the Naxalite movement took place, which is uh, just a couple of, uh, uh, maybe 60, 70 or 100 kilometers away from uh, Gangtok and Sikkim, right? So, and, and those, so the focus, the focus was heavily invested in Northeast, in uh, Northeastern part of India, in North Bengal, in Sikkim, all of those things were happening between 1965 and 67. There is also a theory that says, oh, you know what, 67 was an instinctive skirmish. I think that's taking it a further level down uh, when we talk about it. Chinese do not do, do not undertake any operations, any kind of battles without thinking. You know, they had, they had, a, they had their plans in mind. And a lot of incidents that happened between 65 and 67 testify to that, uh, to that, to their thinking that you know look china had an objective in mind the objective was to was to was to show india its place because in 1965 they had been pushed back at sikkim and uh, there are several events that happened between 65 and 67 including the fact that you know in 1966 it was the first time that chinese forces uh, arrived in doklam which again met with stiff resistance from india Mrs. Indira Gandhi uh, was very categorical in uh, pushing back the Chinese at the diplomatic forum. She went to the media and then, of course, the Chinese pulled back. But uh, Doklam happened for the first time in 1966. <clears throat> uh, then there is also a less documented, but, but an interesting incident that happened in uh, early 1967 when uh, a couple of Indian diplomats two young Indian diplomats in Beijing when they had gone out for, uh, you know, they were posted in Beijing, then they'd gone to a local temple and started filming the local uh, ancient temple. They were uh, picked up by uh, Chinese intelligence agents and they were uh, accused of spying. So these two Indian diplomats were then subjected to a public court and a public trial and flogged and kicked out of China to Hong Kong. And, uh, as it happened in China, India and Mrs. Gandhi, uh, you know, gave it back to the Chinese in the same coin. Mrs. Gandhi uh, got the entire Chinese embassy under house arrest. And there were also demonstrations and uh, people who had gathered outside and some of the Chinese uh, officials were injured. Uh, then uh, the, the two nations were on the brink of war, given that both the consulates, both the, uh, you know, the diplomatic missions were under uh, house arrest and there was nobody uh, available to talk to the local uh, authorities, uh, given the relations were, had, had become very strained between the two countries at that, at, at, at that point. Um, it also so, it, it so happened that, you know, the Chinese, after the, the, the diplomatic row had thawed, 
the Chinese had sent an aeroplane to evacuate their uh, diplomatic staff. The, uh, the Indian government refused to refuel the aircraft, saying that, you know, well, uh, we wouldn't spend your, our fuel on your aircraft. So all of those things are happening. So there was always, uh, there were several pins and tussles uh, that were going on from 1965. So, uh, and this 1967 issue had been there for a while. General Sagat, ever since he had gone to Sikkim, he wanted to, uh, and there were Chinese incursions that were happening uh, as usual, you know, post-1962 as well. They would come in, the patrols would come in. So General Sagat decided that, look, uh, we need to do something about it. And he also uh, wanted to have, therefore, wanted to have a, a barbed wire fence which uh, which would then uh, decide be you know be be the be the border which serve as a border which the chinese disagreed the chinese said no this is not something that we agree to and that started off a series of arguments and uh, which led to fisticuffs which led to pulls and pushes and you know there was a um, there were a lot of these little nuggets and stories that you'll find in the book i wouldn't go into too many of them but then uh, there was a second Grenadiers uh, battalion that was there uh, at Nathula. And uh, as the skirmish happened, uh, the Grenadiers, I must say, I must tell the viewers, you know, they have um, that battalion had uh, many of the soldiers from Rajasthan and Haryana, Jats from Haryana. So they, uh, there were the, when the fisticuffs happened, they broke a few Chinese Moses and one of the Chinese. A Chinese political co commissar who's a very senior person uh, in the Chinese uh, hierarchy. His spectacles were broken, his nose was broken. So the Chinese were, uh, you know, beaten up a couple of times uh, and the arguments continued to fester. Uh, and that's how you reached a point where, uh, you know, the battles took place and, the, you know, it came to a point where the Chinese went back and they were the ones who actually started the firing and they were the ones who. Who, who kicked off the battle? Uh, at the end of the day, it was India that put in that the battle was started by China. You know some interesting tidbits you've told us. I'm sure it'll 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 um, light a little fire amongst the viewers to know a little more. And uh, I'd like you to kind of do that so that people actually read this because it's important. And uh, thank you for actually leaving those little. Um, Little fires burning around the place, which will tell people, yeah, padho, let's find out what actually happened. Uh, especially the CIA story, you know, everybody's uh, always, uh, the minute you mention CIA in India, uh, excuse me, what? That yeah. that thing stands up and everybody's got a little bit of a defensive that, that stands up because one knows what CIA does. So coming back to uh, this particular story now, uh, you brought us to the point where these incidents started. Um, you know, and this and that. Now, my question to you is, see, compiling an incident where the official history has not been told, except for first-hand accounts, which which are damn difficult in today because most of the guys are uh, no more with us or some yeah. of the guys are very, very old. Um, right. How do you actually get to these little stories and, um, you know, put them together to make a certain context? Because mm. that's what builds the the the... the the certainty of what actually happened in 1967. Uh, the problem, why I ask you this question is because if you read um, the con conventional narrative, which was written before, I would say 2015 or 2010, was about, yeah. that's it. Only right. army circles or the armed forces circles knew about some yeah. right? And the maneuver that took place. 67 was termed as a place that was a place where there was a That's it. Right. Right. Nobody talks about who prevailed, this and that and the other. So how did you kind of join these two together and, uh, you know, tell us about uh, the factor that how easy it is to write war history in India, especially when you don't, when you don't have any official records or any official right. uh, public yeah. records. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're right, Adi. There are no uh, official records of 1965, 71, um, and 1962, which is such a shame. And I have written about it uh, in a couple of newspaper columns as well. That you know, look, this is something that we must rectify. Yeah. And we haven't uh, official. We, we haven't written official records. 
So we haven't written official records of the wars we've won uh, and uh, some of the significant wars uh, that have that have transformed history. So you know that is one, which is which is what makes it even more difficult uh, to trace uh, records of a little known set of battles that happened somewhere on the Himalayan shelf in some corner of India, as one would say. Uh, so, good question. What? So therefore, the accumulated information came from a few different kinds, few kinds of sources. One, uh, primarily, you know, I had to, I, it's a combination. So there are, you know, there were oral sources. Then there are, there were papers and articles written by uh, historians. And I must, you know, thank them for writing uh, the accounts of 1967. There are, there are accounts, there are pieces here and there. And there are uh, papers that have been written. There have been, uh, you know, prominent articles that have been written by historians about 1967, which I relied upon. And you know, I, I must be thankful to them. Then there are, uh, uh, you know, participants, soldiers, diplomats, journalists, and others of that era who had covered or who had participated in those battles or in the events around that time. Uh, of 1966, 67, 68, who were uh, very helpful in sharing their thoughts and uh, their uh, their memories of what had transpired. Especially when I was covering the battles, for instance, you know, I spoke with the the officers and men who had participated in the battles of Nathula and Chola, and I got a great deal of information uh, from them in terms of what actually transpired on the battlefield. And you'll be surprised; their memories are robust. Because they have lived with those memories all through their lives, and uh, they, you know, that's become the center point of uh, their lives. And uh, I wanted to understand from them as well. So one one side was was you know participants of the events, the battles, and the events of those years. Then you had people who had written uh, pieces, who had written articles, who had written not necessarily the ninth Natula and Chola battles alone but who have also written about what happened in 1968, the impact of what had transpir transpired in 1967. They had written about it in, uh, you know, in 1968. Uh, Roderick MacParkuhar is, is, is again mm -hmm. a historian who's written about the fact that, you know, 19, and he writes about it in 1968, that uh, China believes that it cannot overrun India anymore after 1967. And uh, though it is, it does understand that it is st still much more powerful than India, and that's there's no denying that fact. But it also is wary that it cannot overrun India anymore. And he writes about it in 1968, 69. And um, so there are historians who've written about it. Then there are CIA archives. Then there are, uh, you know, there is um, there are these uh, various, uh, you know, uh, versions accounts I, which I spoke about. What happened? Somebody's written a book when they were wargaming in Langley in in the U.S. Uh, so there are there are these independent, neutral observers, historians, uh, and uh, others who've written. And then the fourth kind, which is wherein the least amount of information you can find, are our own archives. Where this, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say, this is the fourth. This is the last, which should be the biggest, but it's the last, because mm -hmm. it is not. A very uh, happy uh, situation. I don't think we do preserve our history as well as we should. And if somebody is telling me that, oh, you know what, we have it, you have to go and look, you have to go and find it. I think that's, I think we're just fooling ourselves. We do not do it as as well and as much and as uh, robustly, nowhere near as we should. Uh, and that's a, it's a sorry state of affairs. You know, it's it took us 53 years. It took us 53 years to talk about our own victories. And we're still debating whether it's a skirmish or a battle or a push or a pushover. I mean, should we not be talking about what happened and what the impact of those exactly. events of 1967 were rather than defining, redefining or reassigning the terms that we must understand them by? I think that is the question that I would like to leave you with. I wish I can answer that. <laughs> I wish any of well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question that, it's, that has perhaps... Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and uh, uh, ask, you, ask you the question. But, you know, it's taken over a half a century to talk about it. And, uh, you know, yes, there are people who've written pieces and papers, etc. But this is the first full uh, 
you know, a, a first, you know, full book on it, uh, a book that talks about what led to 1967, what happened in 1967, and the impact of 1967 on the history that followed. And it took us 53 years. And, you know, we've had, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a combination of several factors, but I wish, I wish it was told earlier. Uh, but as I said at the start, it's never too late. Uh, you know, I, I believe that. And, you know, India, there's a very thing, which is there, sir. But which brings me to a big question about uh, the way we kind of do stuff in India is because why I ask this is because at the end of it, we have a situation today where China has been put up to be 10 feet tall, right? Now, when when stuff like this happens in India, and when clashes take place, that's the time we refer back to, oh, you know, yeah. oh, you know, See, that's, yeah. it's a referral that, that actually takes place. And then there are debates, oh, nay, 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 this wasn't the case, this wasn't the case, this wasn't the case. This. My point is that we are never able to build the right narrative for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that to me is very, very amazing because at the end of it, if people are aware of what story that you're talking about now, I'll just cover this point and get back to the yeah. end yeah. of the story a little bit, because this to me is the most interesting and important thing, sir, because we've lost our narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I agree. And you know, when, one of the things, sorry, you said, please continue. I think you no, sir, please. As a matter of fact, I just want to say when somebody will refer to a book, he'll say, oh, no, no, no. That's his version of it. Conveniently. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's because there is no cross referral. I, I, yeah. It's amazing that we 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 dig our own holes and fall in it and then cover ourselves with it and they said, "Yeah, who put out the lights?" Yes. Now I agree. Yeah. So you know, Adi, one of the things I must I must thank readers and reviewers and everyone that the book has been received very well, and uh, uh, the reviews, you know, have spanned a different, you know. Uh, quite a space, you know, uh, there have been reviews in the Hindu and uh, the Telegraph, and then you've had uh, the Express and, uh, you know, Financial Express and some of the other uh, media outlets as well. So all of these reviews have been, you know, uh, they, they've been, uh, they've spoken about the book in terms of, uh, you know, uh, they've been generous towards, towards the book and towards the writing and towards the narrative or the, towards the narration of the events. And I so I, and the readers have also, uh, you know, uh, had uh, a few good things to say about uh, the stories that have been told, etc. So I think you know, once you have told a story, and you have presented the facts of the matter, and you have identified the various, uh, you know, events and connected them and presented the whole story in right earnest, the readers will uh, read. Uh, and give you an honest uh, feedback. Absolutely. So I'm happy that you know uh, the book has has done well. It has been uh, you know uh, read across uh, you know read by different kinds of readers, and uh, they've they've given a good feed feedback in terms of their understanding of how uh, this the whole uh, set of series of events transpired at that point of time. Uh, one thing that I would like to add in terms of why stories do get forgotten. Is is also, you know, especially 1967, and I and I I tried to figure out why it took us so long, um, especially in this case. Uh, what happened also was that you know 1971, the glorious victory happened, which whitewashed a lot of things that came before 1971. Uh, you would agree that you know it took us a long time to even tell our story of 1965. Uh, which was a full full blown war on the Western Front, and uh, you know Captain Amrinder wrote a book, and before that General Harbuck wrote, of course he was involved then, uh, and there are other historians who wrote, <coughs> but you know it it we haven't, it took us a long time to really talk about 1965 um, in in an elaborate manner, uh, which which also shows that you know 1971 hogged a lot of the limelight, which kind of. Uh, did not allow some of the stories that happened before that to come uh, to limelight. Uh, the other thing I thought, and this I speak more as a scholar, that you know, if a if a battle uh, is led by military leaders rather than political leaders, 
they tend to get overshadowed in in terms of them being recorded in history because the constituency affected in case of a political victory is much larger so when we look at 1971 uh, the the involvement of the political leadership was far greater because of the larger investment of the political leadership alongside the military leadership of course uh, these 70 you know 1971 is recorded and of course it's a larger victory and it's of course it's a grand victory it's a great you know it changed the geography of the region but in in terms of its construct a victory or a, a military victory is uh, which is led by generals where they do not have political stakes uh, do get recorded far lesser than uh, you know those ones which have political stakes so so you know even even if in, even a defeat of 1962 which is which is a war again uh, um, uh, wherein you had reverses had been recorded and it overshadowed a lot of the events that came thereafter and that all that ha- happened as well and it took 1971 to whitewash whatever happened between 62 and 671 the the one thing that we forgot was there was 65 there was a war in 65 we recorded very little of it uh, 767 we completely forgot uh and but if you look at 1967 it is also and it's also emblematic of the transformative years between 62 and 71 it it was at, at a point in time when india was changing the military leadership had changed and you had general sagat uh who was not part of the uh 1962 war you had uh, uh you know his boss was uh and general arora and uh, general arora's boss was uh, uh, sam in 1967 as well as in 1971 and and the people <coughs> who were involved in 1971 the generals general sagat singh was involved in the um, liberation of dhaka and he was uh, again uh, at the center of of the battles in 1967 as well so if you look at it it was a it was an era of transformative leadership From 1965, 67, 71, General Harbaksh uh, and uh, he marshaled Sam in 71. General Sagat, General Sagat's role in 67, 71. So, so you know, six, after 62, this this was a transformative period in Indian military leadership, and 1967 is also emblematic of uh, of of that. Uh, besides being uh, a year when India defeated China in two battles. He- interesting thing i think you you kind of hinted towards this india see okay uh, let me rephrase that i think um, i have yeah. a thought but i'm not able to articulate it you you've put across something very interesting which which talks about the factor of a mental state yeah. and again the lack, lack of a narrative of self confidence mm-hmm. uh, which kind of uh, probably in the military got very very hardcore reinforced after 65 67 and i'm sure looking at the chinese getting thrashed in uh, 69 as well so they 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 had to be see it's it's always a uh, you know it's it's a it's also a mental state of affairs of an armed forces which which kind of makes it fight uh, so what kind of an impact do you think we went through the armed forces after 67 uh which helped us in that little standoff we had in 75 helped us in the major standoff which we had in uh uh, uh um, you know the late 80s 87 88 during the sumrongchu issue and so what is the what is the lesson that the armed forces in your opinion took sir and the the, the kind of uh, uh, understanding of the chinese that changed because at the end of it today as well the armed forces do understand that the chinese are who they are and you know this and that and the other and those were of course days of the days of the mao you know the mao if i may yeah, uh, yeah. today is the they of a uh, of a uh, xi jinping they're different yeah. yes. so how do you think that the armed forces got impacted because of this because clearly the impact didn't go out of the armed forces it just stuck within there let's understand the impact on that particular aspect sir sure sure so the more i look at 2020 and 2022 the more i look at more it seems that i'm looking at 1960s uh, the late 1960s uh, you know uh, in two years in coming yeah one, Yeah, yeah, more ways than one because I'll I'll tell you how. And in the 1987, you brought up Somdurongchu, which is also part of my book. 
the reason why it was it is part of the book is because the events events that transpired in Somdurong Chu in 1987 were uh, again indicative of what works what works in a standoff against the chinese in which general sundar ji had taken leave out of the playbook of general sagan singh of you know 20 years back uh how was that so 1967 <clears throat> when these fisticuffs and scuffles and quarrels and you know pushes and pulls and uh, you know the fights were going on between the two sides uh, from the 6th or 7th of september to the 10th of september general sagat was preparing for a situation where the chinese would open up with their automatics or something would give and he would need to be prepared for that so uh, you know he didn't wait for the chinese to really call the shots and then look behind look over the shoulder to figure out what do i do it was not something that was his style therefore what did he do he realized by the 9th of september that there would be this the the fisticuffs the scuffles the quarrels would end up badly that something would happen and that he would have to mount an offensive or give a befitting response to the chinese else he would look bad or i mean it, it would be another series of uh, defeats against the chinese who knows where it would be. so he had decided to bring up the artillery he had prepared himself well he had called a meeting of the battalion commanders and the other commanders in the brigade uh, on the 10th of september which is there in the book and what he had said and what he had briefed and what you know so so he had this intuitive understanding of what would happen we we just finished with the football world cup and they talk about game sense you know they talk about game sense um you talk about coaches you talk about players and you talk about game sense what's going to happen that intuitive understanding of how the game would un- unravel going forward unfold yeah. this, uh, this intuitive understanding of how a battle would progress this is my understanding from reading of history and the battles and his approach 1967 his approach in 1961 in goa he was the he was the general, he was the brigade commander then and he was the one who was responsible for the liber- liberation of goa in 1961 and 67 and he was again responsible for the liberation of dhaka in 1971 so if you look at his uh, approach and there is a there is a common theme that appears and that common theme is that he doesn't in in, in none of these does he wait for the opposition to take the advantage he rather rather he takes the advantage he it's it's a, it's a very it's a common place term it's a cliche term initiative it's a cliche term if i say initiative is a yeah, yeah of course initiative is a is a term that we must uh, we must deploy it must be done yeah yes but it is uh, easier said than done uh, and initiative is 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 worth it when it is combined by a sense of timing Uh, otherwise you might take an initiative at a wrong time right so he understood during the course of those scuffles that took place from the 6th of september to the 10th of september that something is going to give very soon and so he dip- he brought up the artillery he made sure that people were ready he made sure that the rt op uh, was ready so that you know they could see uh, where the chinese targets lay what hap- what was happening etc it's interesting that the permission to unleash the artillery barrage uh, had to be given from the prime minister's office and oh. uh, yes so general sagar had decided general sagar when the battle started and you know i wouldn't go into the you know details of what happened and how the battle started and you know the the the, the scuffle on the 11th morning led to again you know fisty cops and the chinese got beaten back and then they went back to the trenches and they opened up with automatics instantly killing a bunch of indian soldiers and it caused uh, mayhem uh, general sagat took charge he had already had plan b where uh, and the chinese were had you, you know the chinese used the artillery but the artillery had uh, you know the the chinese artillery shells were going over the indian uh, defenses because they You know, they were in a parabola that led them uh, that 
you know, let those artillery shells to fall behind the Indian defenses. So they're not really harming the Indian defenses, but they've kept the uh, Indian uh, the heads low, heads down. Mm -hmm. What happened was that General Sagat decided to use the artillery, though he had asked for permission, but he had decided to use the artillery. And by using the artillery, he pounded the Chinese into submission. He destroyed uh, the Chinese bunkers, the you know the routes that came up from uh, Yapu Valley, and you know uh, so the Chinese uh, had been completely decimated by the time the artillery pounding uh, had ended. Uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, they threatened to use the air force if the battle had didn't end. So you know they were at the receiving end, which is how the Nakula battle ended. So you know to your point. So, uh, so, the, so the psychological advantage had been wrested by India in 1967 in Nathula. The Chinese thought that it was a flash in the pan and they should, um, you know, it was somehow the Indians won in Nathula. They couldn't quite believe why that happened. Uh, and that's why 15 days later, they uh, got into another argument and this time with the Gurkhas. And uh, my book starts with this action of a young Gurkha soldier who, waded into the Chinese uh, young Gurkha soldier from 11 Gurkha Rifles Regiment. Uh, and he waded into the Chinese. He locked off five Chinese heads uh, at Chola after one of the one of his uh, one of one of the Gurkha soldiers, Gurkha NCOs was bayoneted by the Chinese. Uh, this young Gurkha soldier, 21 year old Devi Prasad Limbu, uh, waded into the Chinese with nothing but his Kukri and he locked off uh, five Chinese heads swishing and swinging and, you know, uh, lopping off Chinese heads before a machine gun shot him dead. But by that time, he had dented Chinese confidence tremendously and taken away the advantage right at the start of the battle at Trula. The Chinese couldn't quite recover. And though they had had some advantage at some point of time as the battle went, wore on, it was just a one and a half day battle. Uh, the, the, the Gurkhas, again, you know, pounded the Chinese with um, RCL guns, uh, with an RCL gun, and and uh, they again quietened the Chinese. No territory was won, no territory was lost in 1967. You know, we have critics of 1967 who might say that, oh, India didn't win any territory. Of course, India didn't. Uh, but India lost territory in 1962, which again, India got back. In 1967, uh, and of course, the Chinese have taken uh, territory in the 50s and 60s, so let's not talk about a lot of other <laughs> things. Uh, 1967, we did not win territory, we did not lose any territory, but we wrested the psychological advantage, which uh, was your question actually, and uh, which uh, was again used to the fullest in 1987 at Sundarongshu. There, General Sundarji took a leaf out of uh, General Sagat Singh's playbook, and again, I use the word initiative, speed, and surprise, which are again terms used very uh, often, but deployed uh, not so often. Uh, so, you know, those are uh, the elements that uh, General Sundarji used. And he, he, he uh, took an entire brigade uh, and uh, surrounded the Chinese and dominated the Chinese, pushed the Chinese back from where they had uh, come in without firing a bullet. And uh, General Sundarji's actions in 1987 were again a rerun of General Sagat's uh, actions. And and like you said, these are not understood outside the uh, army, which is right. I'll tell you of an incident that happened in 1987. There was a call that was made from Delhi, from the uh, Foreign, Foreign Ministry Office. And General, or General Sundarji was asked, you know, by uh, someone, by a diplomat, by a senior ranking diplomat in the Foreign Ministry, that the Prime Minister is not happy uh, that you have not pulled back because uh, Indian and Chinese troops were in a state of serious standoff and uh, ran the risk of uh, going to war. So General Sundarji was told that the Prime Minister was unhappy that despite several uh, several uh, directives, General Sundarji hadn't pulled back troops uh, from the standoff. To which General Sundarji said, uh, well, in that case, please let the Prime Minister know that he's not getting good advice and he must get uh, good advice. So, uh, and this this is again, uh, you know, is documented in several books um, and, uh, and also 
you know i was i was also told first hand by somebody so uh, so these these are things that uh, happened and they show the kind of confidence that was uh, there in the leadership and amongst the troops so you know when rajiv gandhi who was a prime minister then heard of this he went he went to sondurunch he went to sondurunch to address the troops and uh, adi i'll just uh, kind of corroborate what you said about the the kind of confidence the kind of uh, josh that is there amongst troops and officers and rajiv gandhi was addressing troops in sondurunch in 1987 and uh, he asked the sainik sammelan that uh, आप बताइए आपको यहां रहना है या पीछे जाना है तो वन ऑफ द जेसी वन ऑफ द सूबेदार साहब इसे जहां बोलिए साहब हमें ना तो पीछे जाना है ना यहां रहना है आप हुक्म दीजिए हमको आगे जाना है सो सो द काइंड ऑफ यू नो मोराल काइंड ऑफ कॉन्फिडेंस द काइंड ऑफ यू नो दिलीफ in one side to do a job that had been entrusted uh, was uh, uh, deeply ingrained in every guys no so there is just no doubt i mean i the the valor of the soldiers there is just no doubt in that i mean there is this i don't know what these guys are made of i mean it's 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 amazing sometimes there's no doubt I and mean, never in the history of this country has ever been a soldiers um you know tenacity or the soldiers valor been questioned at times when it's needed they're there and they're far more there than anybody else there's no question about it it's 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 a lot of other factors that have led to whatever it is led up now you know coming towards the end of i really i this this is something that i could talk of the whole day because at the end of it it's it's part of history and it's part of something that i know but of course i can't do that uh, sure. it'll get too long but yes. i want to still ask you a last question sir sure you know uh when you kind of realize the story right you say that as as kids we were told the glorious stories and you know we we heard them and even as kids uh, my father was doing uh, staff college during those days uh, so he tells us the stories about uh, sundromchu Yeah. The, you know this is what was the game and this and that so uh, we know we we are aware right now when you tell these stories in public and when you tell these stories to people who are not much aware of uh, this this whole history between india and china for the general public is 62 uh probably kuch hua tha 80s 90s mein yeah tha yeah एंड उसके बाद एग्रीमेंट्स एग्रीमेंट साइन हो गया 2013 में कुछ गड़बड़ हुई थी जो प्रेस ने यू नो द प्रेस काइंड ऑफ पुट इट अवे एंड देन दिस इज हैपेंड सो दैट्स दैट्स द पब्लिक परसेप्शन ऑफ द इंडिया चाइना रिलेशंस हिंदी चीनी बाय बाय टू फाइट एंड यू नो मोदी साहब गोइंग टू चाइना एंड शी जिंगपिंग कमिंग हियर एंड देन देयर इज फाइट सो दैट्स अ क्लियर परसेप्शन व्हेन यू एक्चुअली कम अराउंड एंड से ओके यार गाइस देयर इज लॉट मोर टू दिस थिंग यू नो वी हैड स्टैंड ऑफ्स वी हैव एक्चुअली वन स्टैंड ऑफ्स Yeah. there have been a lot of thrashings that have happened a whole lot of things have taken place how do you what is the kind of reaction that you get from the common common um people uh, the 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 a common man on the road who who suddenly realizes yeah there's just a lot more that i don't know yeah so what what kind of feedback have you got uh about your book from people uh, away from the armed forces nowhere mm-hmm. connected uh just simple indians who have read this and said wow what yes. i mean is there anything else that you've come to know yeah i think uh, you know they uh, that's that's a, that's a relevant question because the book when i was writing i had this in mind that you know it is a book that i would write for uh, fogies as well as non fogies and everyone you know it has to be understood it had, cannot be too very jargonistic that was my intent uh, so that's the I start you 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 are hitting the spot right there sir thanks so much for that <laughs> that was the start that was the start because you know i didn't want a book that that is uh, full of facts but it, it's unreadable you know it had to be a narrative that is understood absorbed taken and uh, you know people can and can take it home and, and keep it in, inside their heads and retain the story and that was the intent 
uh, I think I'm quite happy with the fact that you know people have taken people have uh, welcomed it, and I'm quite thrilled with that. You know, I I have gone and spoken to many non-military forums, which include uh, you know. Well, when I say non-military forums, I, know, I don't include think tanks because you know think tanks have military scholars and scholars yeah, who yeah. understand military history very well. And I, you know, I've spoken at many of those think tanks as well, which is far for the course. But I think uh, more so schools and uh, you know institutions, uh, you know management schools, uh, IITs, uh, you know several of these kinds of institutions as well as corporate institutions. Uh, and friends and others and lit fest where you have a cross section of people coming in, you know. So I, I think uh, it's been received very well, which is what has given me the greatest joy. The greatest joy for me is that the story has been lapped up, read, understood, and welcomed. Uh, there are um, th and people have several kinds of questions, and which have enabled me to push my frontiers and to 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 gather my own understanding of why this didn't happen and why it was not told why uh, it should have uh, you know why a certain section could have been uh, uh, told better or or something of that nature you know so that's okay. that's helped me understand the context better it has also helped me uh, understand what what has been received uh, well from within the, uh, the 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 entire book uh, you know what section what part uh, but I think people have uh, welcomed it, and that's that's been the most satisfying part of uh, Watershed 1967. That you know you have had several sections of people across India and overseas as well. You know, one of the first people who organized this, uh, the launch was uh, was an overseas Indian association in UK. We, it's interesting because the book uh, was released in February 9, 2020, and uh, after and in March. Uh, this is a, a bit a, a story that I'd like to share. You know, uh, I uh, the book was it had had only one physical launch before it uh, before COVID struck and we all went indoors. And the book sold uh, a lot through Amazon. People had a lot of time to read. I I did uh, go on tons and tons of webinars and you know to institutions, uh, you know think tanks, etc. So it was well received. The one launch that the book had was in Calcutta. And uh, so I walked up to the Eastern Army commander who was from my regiment, then Eastern Army commander. And uh, so I said, sir, I have a book launch tomorrow. It would be, be, be a privilege to have you there if it's possible. So he said, you know, give me the book. Let me read uh, the book quickly. So he read 60 pages. He read uh, very kind of him to do that. And he came the next day. He opened. He launched the book, General Chauhan, who is now the CDS. So uh, it was. It's interesting that Watershed had. Uh, so after COVID, uh, the there was a launch at a lit fest in Delhi, and then CDS General Bipin Rawat launched the book. So you had had uh, two launches, uh, different different uh, sides of COVID before and after East Army Commander and the CDS, and now you know the other CDS. Commander. So, so it's interesting that happened. Um, uh, and on, in terms of reading of history, I uh, one of the one of the reasons why I feel his, reading history, reading some of these events is important. Is otherwise, it, they are they are written by uh, people who might have an agenda. I'll give you I'll give you an example. 1962, and it's a very well written book by Neville Maxwell about 1962. No question about it. But then he had a certain subjective. Uh, yeah. uh, understanding of it, which is which is which is not surprising. Every every book of history will have a subjective understanding of the of, of the of the narrative. Uh, so he wrote the he wrote about the 1962 war. Um, the impact had went far beyond the writing of history. Henry Kissinger was visiting uh, Peking, and not Henry Kissinger. I think yes, it was Henry Kissinger, and he was he was given a copy of the book, uh, India's China War, by Neville Maxwell. And when Henry Kissinger went back, and uh, he shared, and he was greatly impressed by what Neville Maxwell had written, uh, the book that was presented by Xiao Wen Lai. Xiao Wen Lai had given the book to uh, Henry Kissinger when he was visiting, and that book was Neville Maxwell's book. So he was very impressed by the book 
And so he went back. He shared his views on China with President Richard Nixon. I have, you know, I went through those Nixon tapes and there are instances when Nixon and Kissinger talk about uh, China and talk about the rise of China and the reason that they should align with China, etc. And Neville Maxwell's book played a great part in, uh, in, in, in steering Kissinger and Nixon's understanding of uh, India-China relations and the Indian mindset, the strategy, etc. And when they were urging China to mount pressure on India in 1971, and Nixon even said, you know, tell the Chinese they might they should fly a few planes and you know bring their air force and Indians will be scared. He was <coughs> he was coming from a standpoint of 1962, the book written by Neville Maxwell. So Neville Maxwell's book had an impression on the American leadership in 1971 war. This is the kind of impact history uh, or uh, a writing of history can make uh, on political events of the day. So it's important uh, that we, we read our history or we write our history uh, as, so that we, we are able to tell our history um, in a way that is uh, biased and objective. There is a saying, there's an African saying, and I just finished with that. And there's an African please, saying, please. That, Take your time, till, sir. Till, the, till the lion learns to write, it's the hunter who will tell the story of the jungle. How apt that is, because at the end of it, uh, till now, we've been told to believe. And, you know, I one thing I would actually like to say about uh, history is the fact that what we see, I, I call this the Indian Renaissance. Right. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues within our society today. Hmm. But uh, issues within our society are part of a change. Right. They're part of a renaissance that take, take place. If you don't have issues, that means there are hidden which right. is what we had for the past 60, 70 years. We, we, everything was brushed under the couch. Right. Yeah. Today, if we have issues, is because every the carpet is being dusted and everything is coming out. And there will be issues. There will be differences. Yes. There will be yes. fights. And there will be... All that will be there. Yes. I call this the Great Indian Correction. And, you know, I'm putting this out on YouTube somewhere down the line, 20 years down the line. If I'm wrong, fair enough. If I'm right, I'd like a couple of thumbs ups. That's all. Because uh, without knowing ourselves, we have yeah. charted on a journey of making a country and trying to amalgamate ourselves into a people. And today we are on right. the pathway of becoming one of the strongest countries in the world. Right. Uh, strongest countries in the world, which is beginning today to rec reconcile with this history. And so... Right parts played by people like you and many other people who write books about these kind of events are the most critical games to kind of change perceptions uh, because of the narrative war that we see in front of us today. And I, I, you know, I'm personally a very big fan of the narrative because I find today military wars, fair enough. I mean, Russia is beating Ukraine, but losing the narrative war. And that's our disease as well. We also, we have a innate problem of not bothering about the narrative. We did a little better, about 10% better in Yangtze, if I may. Uh, yes. We put out a yes. fake uh, video telling people it was fake and it still got accepted. So you can imagine the the, the relevance of your word today. And so right. my thank you to bringing out that Indian word. That's something that I wanted to actually close this story about because at the end of it, what has been written, as you just said, the story of 1962 has been written by Nobody from around here. So an Indian bringing out an Indian story about an Indian victory is the key to our this thing. And I'm not just saying victory. It should also be about the defeats. Uh, right. We as a country need to learn. I am very proud of 1962. What we did, yes. even yes. when we lost, I mean, I'm very proud of it. There, there's just no question about it. So, so sorry, uh, are they, uh, there, are, there are wonderful books about 1962. And I must now, say sir, that... Yes. You, Yes. And, and again, uh, like you said, you know, many of these books were uh, taken out of the shelves. You know, they were they were banned. Uh, Brigadier Dalvi's book was uh, yeah. not read for many years. Yeah. So, you know, some of those things and, and Brigadier Dalvi's book was banned. So yes. Neville Maxwell wrote a history which was therefore understood as the version of China and whatever it was version. And, and that version See, was accepted. You, you can imagine if Chow Lai gave it to Henry Kissinger. Yes. That's how it happened. You know, and, uh, and then you had Bertie Lindner who came and wrote. And there are several other people. And I think uh, there is there is a book, uh, The War That Wasn't, 
by Shiv Kunal Verma in 1960. Yes. And uh, there are several ones that are written. And uh, I think the more there are books, the more uh, better, the better the understanding of history there will be. Absolutely. And apart from that, you know, online forums, and I'm just going to take a little bit of a tiny credit. And of course, a lot many more people who talk about these things, who I'm sure interacted with you as well, play a little role in changing the perceptions in, 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 uh, in the society today and bringing about a more realistic geopolitical viewpoint of the two relations between the two yeah. countries. There's always that innate scare which is there. But for people who are aware of history, that scare is never there. And you find them reacting to situations differently, analyzing situations differently, uh, you know, putting out information differently because they understand the background of what is happening. They understand the background of the history which is attached to it. And that is very critical for us. So, you know, my my gratitude for actually uh, choosing and writing this particular book and not because of anything else, but it is required. Uh, personally, I, I love reading these kind of things. I've got six of them I'm reading right now. Uh, I think yours is, I you know, the, 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 the fourth one that I need to read. So it's right. for me, it's, I'm re-educating myself completely. Right. And every day it's an eye-opener for myself when I read certain things and I'm wondering what have we done. Uh, but having said that, as I said, this is the great renaissance of India where we learn about ourselves and become more proud about who we are as people and more proud about the forces that protect us each and every day on the borders. Sir, I'd like to... You want to say something? Sir? I just wanted to thank you for... Uh giving, uh, you know, for, for giving the opportunity to speak uh, and discuss this subject with you at your forum. And I think you're doing a stellar job. Uh, you know, uh, I would I would say, you know, in Mahabharat, you had uh, Sanjay who was conveying the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the course of the battle. So the, here it's not the battle, it's a course of history and, and several other features which, which get, uh, you know, uh, which appeared on your platform and I have watched your some of your other shows. What I have liked is the unbiased objective approach, which uh, really enables the viewer to distinguish, distill and uh, determine the, you know, the, the, the right things and, and understand uh, things in the right context, which is which is something that's absolutely required in this uh, age. And uh, as we celebrate our the different versions of history and strategic opinion etc it's also important that uh, we we bring in in the right manner the renaissance of our, of our era as uh, and through through such kind of platforms that you host so thank you very much for uh, thank you so much sir looking forward for more interactions in the future and jai hind jai